researching the history of child poverty uh, in New Zealand, um, it, was, it was really noticeable that there was a, a total lack of uh, studies and statistical uh, records. And according to independent New Zealand economist Brian Easton, um, there was very little done before the 1972 Royal Commission on Soil Sec uh, Social Security. Uh, however, while doing this research on poverty, I did run across into a lot of records on welfare and history, um, whose existence has been widely recorded and discussed. Uh, and so there's been this connection between welfare and poverty um, formed, and so I'm asking, like, why is this? Well, um, sorry. Um, the government-led uh, welfare uh, was established um, in, New in New Zealand in 1898 with an um, old age pension. Um, this was for 65 years and over. It was means tested. Um, it was brutally racist. Um, but it wasn't sexist. Women had equal right to it. Uh, it was aligned um, with the sense of citizenship, a sense of entitlement. Okay. So it wasn't based on the charity model, which was a competing model at the time, which had very strict criteria. Um, so it was, a, it was a gift from the state to enable those receiving, and this is very key words, um, to participate and belong. And that was a legal um, term. So Michael Joseph Savage, the Prime Minister at the time, he was very into this idea of, um, we are our brother's keeper. Yeah? So there's this extended sense of generosity there. Um, from the social, uh, sociological perspective of functionalism, welfare became a tool for the government to create stability in society for the greatest number of people by repositioning poverty as a deviance from the norm. Okay. Um, according to recent Australian uh, research on New Zealand welfare reforms, contemporary welfare action <coughs> perpetuates inequalities and discrimination something that Emile Durkheim, a functionalist, saw as functional importance for society, finding an outlet for its hostility against deviant groups as a means of contributing to the solidarity of the community. So that's rather disappointing. Um, what's, I'm kind of confused. I haven't, what side are we going to? Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, next slide. Yes, thank you. Sorry, slide four. Yeah. Um, throughout New Zealand history, the National Party has represented the farmers who are landowners and therefore the owners of the means of production, the rulers. The Labour Party, therefore, by default, re re uh, represented the interests of the oppressed workers, those without the means and the means of production, the ruled, the parents of children in poverty. This all changed in the 1980s when the Labour government adopted the policies of the ruling class the free market system. In 1994, the international magazine The Economist observed, it is, it is no coincidence that the biggest increases in income inequalities have occurred in economies such as those in, of America, Britain and New Zealand, where free market economy economic policies have been pursued most zealously. <coughs> What did the um, financial minister, Bill Birch, say when faced with the statistical evidence that income discrepancies, disparities, in New Zealand were becoming wider and wider back in 1994? He replied, it doesn't worry me. Effectively, what the Labour Party has done by adopting the policies of the ruling class, the free market system, they have silenced the voice of the disadvantaged parts of society. There is no longer representation of the oppressed at, major, at a major political level. If we look at conflict theory, which emphasizes the tension between individual groups and society, we can start to understand how disastrous it has been for the poor of New Zealand that the ruling class have been able to so completely dominate both sides of the conflict between rich and poor. Research has found that over 80% of New Zealand's oppressed poor are adults who live and care for children and have subs subs subsequently the children themselves. Uh, ever since its inclusion as international institutional policy, child poverty has been defined by the language of the bourgeoisie, the ruling class. The proletariat, the child in poverty, is forced to fit into this mold because all of the institu institutions of society, particularly education, religion, and the economy, 
a shape to serve the exploitive purposes of the ruling class. Oh, sorry, that was this. That's what we were talking about just now. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can see the bottom 50 percent. Bottom 50 um, percent of the people are in 7 percent of the wealth. Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, take for example this sheet from the um, Children's Commission, uh, a government-appointed body who claimed to be promoting solutions to child poverty. Uh, of 78, 78 recommendations, not one suggests a redistribution of wealth. Of 270,000 children, um, these are actually customers, consumers, 270,000 of them. $6.8 billion um, costs here. Um, now this is a $6.8 billion industry. The solutions to poverty is feeding off child poverty. Um, this is poverty recycling. When we analyze what is happening here, we see that the structure maintains the social, economic, political, and coercive power of one group at the expense of all others. Just before 2011, here in New Zealand, a TV documentary was presented on child poverty in New Zealand. <coughs> this expose was a powerful language tool that forced an unwelcome connection between the national labor voting public, the mainstream, with the existence and consequences of child poverty. With a symbolic interactionist sociological perspective, everything in society is based on how we interpret our cultural symbols, media images, the language, stereotypes, and perceptions and beliefs of these systems. Uh, research has found that child poverty is much widespread than today's conventional image that the typical household is brown, solo parent beneficiary in rental accommodation. In fact, the statistical reality is that there are more Pākehā than Māori and Pacifica who are poor. There are more in two adult families than solo parents that are poor. There are more dependent on wages than benefits who are poor. And there are more in their own homes with mortgages than in rental accommodation who are poor. Next slide. So, this real picture exposes the language barrier between the dominant discourse and the ruling class. In reality, if working Pākehā in, in two adult relationships with children and a mortgage were to become aware that they were the majority of the poor, that it was their children who are oppressed by poverty, not some other symbolic other, this war between the promoted stereotype, stereotypical picture and the reality could dissolve. The shock of this deviant other, the impoverished child, bearing strikingly similar characteristics to that of the dominant group, the ruling class, could lead this majority to gather the means and assert the will to actually end child poverty and thus poverty in general, which demonstrates just what a powerful grip the ruling class has on the interpretation of symbols. 